back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we take a midweek break to catch up on everything else going on in the world of Linux. I'm Vin Stone. I am Pedro Mateos. And I'm Machia Komodo. Yes, spanning all the time zones and all the things. Gentlemen, let's just get right into it, because this is a neat piece of kit. Do yeah, you have Maru an X5? Is <laughs> getting a first public release, so what is Maru? Uh, it's a custom Android ROM that will allow you to run a full Linux desktop on your from your phone as soon as you plug in like a monitor and a keyboard and mouse. Uh, it's you could think it's very similar to what Ubuntu Phone does, but um, the difference it's a real Android system. So you can run your Linux apps, your Android apps, like from the same system. So that's kind of neat. Uh, yeah, so that's some big competition on the Ubuntu conversions front, uh, which is kind of welcome because if you remember a few years back, there was a project from Canonical called Ubuntu, um, Ubuntu for Android, yes. Uh, very similar, and they kind of stopped that, and that was a bit shameful because I was very interested in that. So the thing is, it only works on Nexus Five devices. Yeah, the the reason uh, why they stopped it is because it's not you're not running Linux natively on the phone. It's um, basically running on top of sort of a VM, and still as much uses hum- the kernel of uh, Android. Yeah, uh, but the, as much of a humph as the Nexus 5 have has, I don't think it's enough for that specific kind of workload because it's running Android and Debian at the same time. And Debian, it's not exactly native, so the performance is probably not going to be all that great. Yeah, but there's still, they still uh, the, uh, ship it with like Blender, Inkscape, uh Lots of software. Yeah, I, I mean, it definitely also the, comes with OpenShot. And I was like, oh, Lord, please don't be OpenShot 2.0. Don't be. And I was like, whew. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, it's the four-year-old version of OpenShot. And uh, yes, that is a good <laughs> thing, believe it or not. Um, kind of with you. I was a bit depressed because I apparently own every other Nexi that has ever been invented, but not the five. So I uh, can't play around with it. And... I really don't want to buy an older, you know, uh, a Nexus 5 just to test it, but um, it is interesting. It doesn't require Mir, which I, I think is a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, bonus, I, was, so. I was looking at the Nexus 5 devices on eBay, and you can grab one for less than 150 uh, So that's, I mean, if it gets, uh, if it's really good, I might try it. I mean... And now it's needs. open, so I'm kind of waiting for someone to figure out how to get it working on, you know, like a shield tablet or something, hint, hint. That way I can give it a go. I don't know. But, I guess kind of the ultimate thing with this is really coming up with a solid use case because after you get through, like, that's really neat. And like, <laughs> But as you were kind of saying, you can kind of do some things. You know, it's a glorified Raspi power type business you, you're not going to get a yeah. whole lot of serious work done on that but who knows early days but you were saying yes but um speaking of things that aren't native <laughs> well actually this is native but in a strange strange world because microsoft has created its own free bsd distribution Yep, <laughs> you heard it right. You may remember a couple of weeks ago when we mentioned that they had created their own Linux distribution. They call it Sonic. And now they have um, a version of FreeBSD. It's based on 10.3. And uh, they say they will support it if you're running it inside Azure, as it were. Uh, so, and uh, one of the things that this article from the register, don't worry, there'll be links in the show notes. One thing they bring up is that Microsoft said that this isn't just a one-way thing. They're not just taking BSD, creating their own thing, and not sharing anything back. Microsoft is actually contributing some of the stuff that they need to change. They're contributing that back to BSD, so that's good. 
Yeah, man. Go Microsoft. Um, a lot of this was <laughs> upstream to uh, the 10.3 release. I'm looking forward to uh, Microsoft Q&X. You were mentioning maybe we'll, we'll see. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, this is all leading to Microsoft resurrecting BIOS. BIOS, MS BIOS. <laughs> but good news for everyone um, stuck in your day jobs having to deal with Azure. Um, I really didn't. I, I don't know why. I Maybe past experience. Um, but uh, we, we can probably say that Microsoft is uh, upstream more Linux commits than Ubuntu, right, Strider? Um, <laughs> Easily. <laughs> Ubuntu has contributed quite a lot. But yeah, what's, when it comes to providing support for Azure, which I want, really want to push, they will contribute to open source. And if you remember a few years back, they, they did send some patches for Hyper-V, for the Linux kernel, mm -hmm. and yeah, they they have the right attitude when it comes to to open source. They have their own motivation, but yeah, that's the right mindset. You use open source, you contribute, and I wish yeah more projects would have that same attitude. All right. What okay, so then, about, um, what we like we like to sneak this in every week a um, little bit of Raspberry <laughs> news because it's such a neat little toy. Uh, the largest maker of Raspberry Pis just acquired for eight hundred and seventy-one million dollars. That is right. Uh, uh, let's see who was it. Uh, Detweiler Holdings AG. It's a Swiss industrial um, component supplier. They picked it mm -hmm. up for that price tag. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like anything major is conflicting with the two companies, but uh, hopefully this will uh, allow them to. Kind of ramp up production, Strider, because um, there's, there's been there's maybe an issue or two with it. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I guess the, some guy, some rich guy, got tired of waiting for his <laughs> Raspberry Pi Zero to, to be shipped. <laughs> so he just bought everything and said, okay, I'll build them myself. <laughs> no, so yeah. what, I, I just hope they won't do anything silly with this. Oh, no, no, no. Um, step one after Microsoft buys the Swiss company is pre-installing Windows 10 on all pies shipped. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did release that um, Windows RT, that was called, uh, based uh, operating system for Windows 10 for the Raspberry Pi 3. So Microsoft buys it. You know that's going to come preloaded. Chances are you'll just be able to pull out the uh, SD card at that point, but yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, you don't ever have to, even if something that ridiculous did happen, this is just one. This is just the largest manufacturer of the pies right now. There, there are several other smaller ones, so we'll always have options to not have any availability of the Raspberry Pi Zero. We all really want one. Get on it. But just a quick mention, because <laughs> we're sorry, we don't know what the use case is for this. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, Dave. Right. I'm afraid I can't do that. Uh, um, mm. This is an instructable about shoving a pie into... Well, the mm. coolest thing about this is the you can download... It's Hal! Yeah, the SVGs <laughs> to print out uh, your own little miniature Hal. And they're like, oh, well, you, we, we don't know what to do with it. And we put a camera in it and something. I was like, listen, you do that and you do the um, Amazon Echo... Yeah, mod. Alexa. <laughs> right, Alexa, you, you put that mod in this, then you have something that might actually be of use. Plus, um, it'll, it'll be nice and super creepy at night, especially if you can get the uh, red light to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, the red LED in there. Yeah, uh, and, um, well, Mycroft is a thing, so maybe we could integrate that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be yeah. that would make a really good custom case for Minecraft. And if you yeah. have a, Minecraft also has a project with uh, uh, voice uh, synthes synthesizer. So if you put the, the voice of HAL 9000 on it, <laughs> that would be kind of neat. But currently, the, the project doesn't do much. Mm -hmm. Nothing that would require a full blown computer. Like it's most, mostly playing WAV files and do some like really simple stuff. And they do have like, something based on uh, vocal recognition, I think, but in the most advanced section. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be a really good use case for Minecraft. Yeah. All right, Strider, what do we got up next? <laughs> uh, yeah, Mozilla. Mozilla has put like half a, half a million dollars into 
uh, fixing open source project, not fixing necessarily, but auditing, making security audits. Uh, because yeah, there have been a few nasty hacks and security breaches in the past few years, mm -hmm. uh, like OpenSSL. Uh, I remember one of, the one from last year where the in-browser PDF reader was exploited to read the contents of .ssh and other such folders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they they made an effort uh, to provide like. To, to put money into fixing and auditing uh, security in open source software, which is really good, which is much needed. Um, mm -hmm. That said, they are being a bit optimistic, I think, because they are hoping that they will, that other companies will uh, join them in that effort. I mean, maybe it will happen, but I don't expect it to. Uh, to happen like this. I mean, the, the, the companies that use open source, most of them that don't, that are not active contributors to open source, they're just a bunch of freeloaders that uh, <laughs> that are that want secure stuff but are not willing to spend a dime. So, hey man, I mean, the best security is obscurity through closed source software, man, with you hippies <laughs> and your open source. Proprietary yeah. is the way to go, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope uh, this opens up. Yeah, the Chromebook is dead. Long live the Chromebook. Yep. The uh, first generation of Chromebooks are now officially EOL. That's end of life. <laughs> So, yeah, if you got one of those original Samsung Chromebooks or one of the original uh, Google Chromebooks, the, uh, what do they call them? The CB20-somethings and the Acer C700s and a few others. If you have those from, like, 2010, 2011, those are being officially put into the end of life status which means they might get some security updates every now and again but they're not going to get them as frequently as they used to so if you're worried about security and you want to make sure you're running um an up-to-date os you have two choices either you get a new chromebook or you just uh, load up a live USB flash drive with your Fedoras or your Ubuntu's or something else. You install those and Chrome and away we go. Well, um, Pedro, you got to remember, uh, especially the first generations, we're usually shipping with about 16 gigs of internal storage. So your idea might not work so good, buddy. It does. 16 gigs is more than enough for your typical Linux distribution <laughs> and Chrome. It is. <laughs> you... You need like what? Eight gigs at most? Yeah. At most, yeah. At most, uh, eight gigs is wide enough for an existor. But yeah, what what I don't get is Chrome OS. Okay, it's based on Chromium OS, which is open source, right? So we should expect some kind of community support from for it, right? I mean, th this is what open source is all about, is that you're not locked in by a particular vendor but chrome so. os in itself is proprietary if you want the the truly open source one you're running chromium os sure yeah but it shouldn't matter that google stops supporting it because as soon as it's end of life then it can be taken over by the community so that's if that doesn't happen that's a huge failure for the, the whole open source model. Yeah, I mean, we saw an yes. attempt, I think, what was it, last week, a week before, somebody was already working on um, open source version for Chromebooks. Uh, yes. But, mm -hmm. big but here, um, sorry, Becky, is <laughs> it didn't support the App Store, which kind of makes it not very useful. Yep, uh, that's the thing. And with the, well, the Chrome OS itself getting support for the Play Store, yeah, that's a hell of a lot of stuff where you don't want to miss out, especially, well, you know, it's just going to be a stopgap measure, though, when you <sighs> think about it, because yeah. there, there really is nothing technical, I would believe, standing in the way of just all Chrome browsers being able to run yeah. everything from the app and, store, uh, right? And anyway, the, the target audience for Chromebooks is not 
the really the, the type to mess around with systems and, and their own ideally system. right ideally yes you would be correct except look at who is using chromebooks nowadays it's mostly you know linus torvalds he's using a chromebook <laughs> um yeah, I, I would have said one user school but... systems but okay well it's uh, most of the people that are currently using chromebooks are geeks nerds whatever you want to call them people like us people who actually know or sort of know what they're dealing with and they are gladly using it most of the typical joes that would actually only require chrome os to do their jobs as it were they are still buying windows laptops hmm. apparently it's they, they sell more chromebooks than macbooks so where are the users yes macbooks <laughs> notice macbooks not windows laptops yeah but there yeah. are still lots of macbooks out there again they're selling yeah. them to school children but from chromebooks Probably. to chromecastic mm -hmm. video lan you know the swiss army knife of video playing couple of new things coming in here. Um, you know, they've sorted a few security issues um, that now has support for external subs and audio over the network. That's a bit neat. And you should now be able to detect Chromecast devices from the QT interface and stream that business. Not really anything for network, uh, not network, but uh, the Androids uh, just kind of updated to that business. But uh, is that neat? I mean, I never thought about Chromecasting. I, I mean, I have a Chromecast uh, from the desktop to my TV. It seems kind of roundabout. I don't. Uh, I never really thought about streaming until Valve introduced it into the Steam client, and I've used it a couple of times with the uh, Steam box and this PC right here. But that was basically it. If it comes to you know movies and YouTube's, I usually watch them while I'm pooping on the tablet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so the the news came from the the webs the the blog from Jean Baptiste Kempf, which I've met once. He's a cool guy. So yeah. But anyway, uh, this is what I would expect from VLC. I mean, if you can stream something something else, VLC should be able to do it. So that's really cool. That's yeah. It handles Chromecast. Uh, that's that's what VLC does, and that's what it's for. It's for streaming stuff from one place to another. So good on them. All right. So speaking of shields, I showed you my tablet twice already. Uh, the Nvidia Shield. They're talking about the Android TV console type thing. Um, the guys from Plex say that that particular device completes them. Yep, they actually have um, a full on. Android TV UI that you can fully control with your standard shield controller. It's it's great. It works. Uh, they have the server uh, app for the, the console. So if you have one of the hard drive versions and you want to put something to serve however many devices you have running Plex on your house, you can actually do it from the uh, shield console. And you can control everything again through the Shield controller. And the client, same exact deal. So good on them. And they actually praise the um, the 16 gigabyte Shield version because even if it's just for a client, they had a really good experience with it. And it's sort of to be expected because Google themselves have praised NVIDIA for the uh, Shield Android TV integration type thing. And its sole purpose is to be a media box. So having Plex on it just makes sense. I know, man. Both of the people that bought them um static. <laughs> Both and of one them. of them is Civic. He's in chat realm um, right now. <laughs> you know, I, I was originally kind of confused and impressed when I, I first heard about this because I thought this was for the NVIDIA Shield, not the NVIDIA Shield. Yes. Uh, or this NVIDIA Shield or <laughs> this NVIDIA Shield or... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I mean, NVIDIA, you kind of deserve that. <laughs> okay. LGCQ. Okay. Uh, Reddit. Monitor your favorite subreddits from the Ubuntu desktop because, I don't know, maybe. Uh, yeah. 
not not much to this. Absolutely not much to this. I mean, what is this? A Time wasting directly yeah. from the tray. <laughs> and it's going to give you uh, your little updates from like uh, new news and new hot um, on the subreddits that you pick out. Uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, I guess. I mean, it's a thing, but yes. W- if you, it is most it, definitely a thing. If you used Reddit for news, maybe I could see, but wouldn't you just like, you know, like try to use Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is a pretty good one. Or if you're using KD, you can actually get the RSS feed and integrate it right into one of the plasmoids. So I don't know. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I'm not, I mean it's, it's a thing. It's, it can, it seems to be working and, to, for what it does, but no, I'm not interested. I'm asking just one single thing from uh, a Reddit app, and that would be to receive notification from uh, replies on posts and comments. Mm-hmm. And no, I, I, every Reddit app that I saw out there doesn't do that. So why uh, is it so hard? Reddit to is get cool for Android. I think does that. Maybe I, maybe I should look into that, but yeah, so far I haven't found a solution for that. This problem, getting notifications from Reddit's, that's the only thing I want. All right. So, um, have you guys ever had any issues trying to find files in your um, in your hard drives? You you mean like uh, locating something? Yes. Nope. <laughs> nope. Okay, then this is not for you. But <laughs> apparently, uh, someone or Duty Evo, as he calls himself, if that is his her real name. Um, he was so angry about it that he decided to make a new tool and call it Angry Search. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's uh, basically a search box. The, that's what the front end is. It's a search box. You type it down and it shows you reasonably fast after you let it run the updating things so it can create its own database and the first time you run it you should probably run it with uh, sudo so it can actually index everything that you have on your file system uh, because it needs sudo in order to index those files that you typically wouldn't have access to but if you do it'll actually be able to access everything and it'll show you all the files and uh, the path that you need and the size and everything the usual search box has. I did give it a shot and it works. It's better slash faster than the search plugin or function that most DEs include. And like I mentioned, it does take a little bit of time to populate the database, especially if you run it with sudo. It has to go through everything, so mm-hmm. give it a couple of minutes. And nope. If I have to be honest, the only search function I use is the one that's usually built into the menu like whisker menu on XFC or Cardapio if you or the advanced mate menu if you're using mate those have built-in search functions and that's usually the one I use or when I push alt f2 and the little run box shows up that can usually do searches as well if I'm looking for a specific file I'll just do the old find forward slash pipe grab thing Hmm, yeah now it looks cool, but I mean we have so many files file indexers on Linux right now. So do we need one more? We need five more. <laughs> <laughs> I, to get a I, mean, I already man. have two <laughs> file indexers installed on my system. Exactly, that's the rev, relevant X, XKCD. <laughs> okay, there are fourteen competing standards. Oh. <laughs> We need to now. There are fifteen. Create one, <laughs> one more to cover all the use cases. Now I already have locate and tracker on my system, and yeah, you can do pretty much the, the same thing on Unity on the Unity desktop. If you press super F, you will get real time <laughs> results for the, all your files, and that's pretty much the same, same thing. So that doesn't break much, I guess. I don't know. More options, more better. I yeah, I have nothing <laughs> negative to say about it. I mean, it's yeah, me neither. Like... And it works. Fact of the matter is, it, it works. works. It so <laughs> that's the thing. Yep. So uh, snappy packages. And unfortunately, this is as well. <sighs> yeah, snaps for everyone. So we talked about uh, uh, snaps uh, on the earlier shows. So these are like self-contained. 
uh, Linux binaries that you can distribute like everywhere. And now they were, they were only supported on Ubuntu at first, but now they made um, they made it available on Debian, on Arch Linux, on Fedora, and pretty much everywhere. So there there was uh, there was an article on Arch Technica about it, and uh, the journalist said goodbye. Uh, apt and yum, which kind of misses the point of what snaps are. So they are not here to replace the classic Linux packages. They are just here to provide the to complement the shortcomings of uh, of distribution packages, which is you can't really easily ship up to date software uh, within. The, the distribution packages, so that's well, need to have. you can actually distribute up to date software within, you know, the typical packages. It's yeah. usually the old ones that are, you know, statically linked to really old versions of really old libraries, and uh, that's where the problem is. Mm, I don't know. I can still run an old tournament, for for example. Well, th this yeah, is a good example. Go back to the first few Humble Bundles and try to run some of those games. Let me know how it works. Yeah, I probably can, yes. <laughs> yeah, you probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, with Lutris, yes, I can. Well, yes. <laughs> I'm talking just out of the box. And yeah. uh, this is uh, kind of prefer. what they're going for. It's what the Snappy packages want to provide. It's an out-of-the-box, self-contained application uh, that will yep. work on just about every single distro that you put them on. And it's fine, except it's statically link all the things in all distributions, because that's a good idea. Yeah. I don't see a problem with this. I mean, the, the problem is I, do, I have yet to see some, some games, some OpenGL software, uh, run with uh, snaps because it shouldn't be really that hard. They just make a uh, well. That's the only dynamic link they, they will need is to uh, libgl or libgl so one. Yeah, but currently, if you go to the the snap store, uh, you will get mostly command line tools. Like you get Apache, you get Nginx, you get like Jenkins. Jenkins was was a big one uh, that they they were having problems packaging, and, and uh, that's a good idea if you know the whole principle of uh, snap packages was respected, which was security. It cr sort of creates that sandbox for the application, which makes them inherently more secure. And speaking of security, uh, Mark Shuttlesworth actually had some things to say because uh, what did he say? Uh... No, I mean, he's got a thing out, and they said, uh, regarding security, I mean, uh, but, well, the issue yeah. kind of might still be there, but that's a problem with X. The limitation will be removed when the Ubuntu finishes its plan to replace X with Mir. Um, <laughs> Wayland, the other major display server in the works for Linux distributions, also changes this behavior. <laughs> so, um, now, uh, listening to you two banter back and forth, uh, sounds like what Strider's going at. This is more of like a server-side... It might be more appropriate for server-side LTS support, stuff like that. Maybe with something without an X server installed on it. Did I get that kind of right? Uh, yeah, it seems to be uh, oriented toward both uh, servers and the Ubuntu phone as well. Mm -hmm. it seems mm -hmm. to be, uh, but for desktop apps, I I'm mean, I've seen more uh, regarding the flat packs we covered earlier which were more GNOME stuff. Mm -hmm. Here, we don't have like that many uh, graphical applications. Well, it remains to be seen just how many issues all that stat static linking will have in the future. Because, yeah, you may remember a couple of years ago, and Ven actually remembers this, it wasn't great. Oh man, you're just misremembering. <laughs> you remember? No, you know how you misremember things. You're like, yeah, the good old times, and you were living through them. You're like, everything's on fire, and I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of things so, that are the... fine, we need to thank the people who make this yes. show possible. Our Patreons, just a keep being awesome. 
Um, we got got some new people. Um, Martin J actually kicked in via PayPal. You can do that. Go to linuxgamecast.com forward slash support the shows. And Freya O, Reptilian Brain, Bjorn, Steve B, and Michael G upped his donation. We do. I mean, it's like a two for one. You're going to get a uh, Linux Gamecast on top of that. That's our big show. Big show. Um, and big this show. is the show made possible by Patreons for Patreons. And we share it with the rest of the world. If you like it, we do have some rewards. Go there. Check that business out. See if there's anything that interests you, um, you know, because it's not necessarily a charitable donation. We do try to make it worth your time. And yes. we thank you very much for it and that's patreon.com forward slash linux gamecast it's also part of this show in our itsy bitsy network because technically two shows network and uh, <laughs> one thing i do want to mention uh, if you're on patreon just for anything else because i also have my own patreon account and i mentioned this on um linux gamecast is one of my pledges like yeah, it was declined and i was like what's going on here because I had just gotten a new card, it had expired, I missed punching it in by one digit, and I don't know if it was just a hiccup with the Patreon at the time, but didn't catch that. So when it tried to process it, it came back declined. So if you're a Patreon, head over there, check that out, make sure everything's right and it doesn't say declined, unless you like it like that. And that's fine too. <laughs> you know. But we appreciate the sentiment anyway. <laughs> absolutely, and uh, you, you get a B- for effort now. <laughs> We do like people to um, contact us so we can um, get back. Yes, yes, we do. In fact, that's one of my favorite things in both Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays and Linux Gamecast Weekly. It's when you guys scream in our direction. Whether you want to leave us some hate mail for Linux Gamecast Weekly or some of the usual feedback for uh, Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday, shut up, bird. And you can you can do that relatively easily. You go on over to linuxgamecast.com for a slash submit it dash posts to <laughs> submit button. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a contact button. It's easy. Just fill out the form, pick if you want to send some feedback for LWDW or some hate mail for LGCW, and we'll be happy to feature your comment, assuming it's Mm, the really nice kind of hate mail or feedback, as it were. And uh, this week we actually have some. Not a whole lot, but some. Tim. Tim, um... <laughs> Be like, what? Oh, he says, here are some questions you won't have to answer when presenting a Windows 10 refugee with Linux Lite 3.0 instead of Zumbuntu. Zumbuntu. How is this pronounced? Hmm. Fair point. Starting out strong. Uh, why is there a mouse unicorn anteater? What does Zumbuntu uh -huh. mean? Question mark. All right. Um, I don't know. Why Ubuntu? I thought we're installing the original Linux and not a distribution. Cheers, Tim. Anyone want to decode that for me? Uh, well, he does kind of have a point. It's like touche, because you may remember last week we were talking about uh, Linux Lite 3.0, and Strider, very, it's a very valid point, which he will reiterate, which he was going, why an ISO? Why not just give me a PSA so I can install it and try it because I don't want to, you know, reformat an entire hard drive just to try your new distribution. But I can really see what he's going for because let's take your typical Windows user. He's, or she, is dumb. He's not particularly in with the um, technology or the shady stuff that Microsoft does, and they don't really care about Linux at all. And if you want to say, try to convince them to use Linux, it's better to have a distribution that's called Linux Lite because that light just immediately clicks into their heads like, oh, okay, so it's lighter, so it's faster, that's better, right? Maybe? Ah, god damn, god damn it. I mean, is, is that it? Is that the motivation behind this project? Is, is the name? I mean, it's not... It's valid. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, seriously, no, no, we can't... Something we can't has never been seen because, in the world. Especially if it's geared toward uh, Windows users, like new users. I mean... Doing a Linux distribution is a lot of work. It's a lot of maintenance. And this guy is not, is not Debian, he's not Canonical, he's not Red Hat or SUS. It takes a huge amount of resources to maintain a Linux distro. And you can't just make your own system just because you want a new name 
or just to ship a new wallpaper. Yes, you your... can. I'm, you can. I'm sorry, you, I have you, to disagree you can, with you. you can yes, you yes. can. You can, but <laughs> it's not because you can do it that you should. That's the point. Not because you can't do it. That's no. splitting hairs, man. <laughs> See, here's the cool thing. I'm out of this fight because we're going to move on to the next one. <laughs> yep. Oh, no. Oh, no. Someone edited their comment. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> all we can read is this. But, you know, we're not even going to get into this. Uh, you know, we mentioned something about uh, somebody not knowing how to benchmark last week. And, yes. Uh, and a... <laughs> they, they basically uh, said some things, thought about it for a second, and kind of went back and said, uh uh okay i i'm gonna edit all of the comments i just made on all the social medias so i don't look like um the yeah send uh, me an email because you know that no one else that, can read uh, that yeah so yeah. um that's that uh thicker skin little buddy thicker skin much thicker oh source forge themselves or whomever was in charge of the source forge account on youtube actually left a comment on uh, last week's show if you visited sourceforge.net you'd see it was already https a lot of stuff was left out which you can read there and they left a link thanks for the mention though sourceforge hey thanks yeah um, I, they were like <laughs> uh, that was a really old article and i was like well it was at the beginning of this year but here's the thing flew under everyone's radio a uh, radio yes uh, radar, radar. <laughs> because well if we're being honest it was about sourceforge and <laughs> Not a lot of people follow that. And it, I finally, it, uh, I saw that and I was like, I didn't notice that. So we did want to give it a little bit of yes. coverage. And it's good that they have um, implemented the HTTPS and done what they said they were going to do. We applaud them on that. Um, what were you saying, Strider? Uh, what I've noticed is that there's a lot of people we cover, we cover on the show that give us, give us feedback. So that's kind of cool. Let's uh, we got, and I don't know how they they they, they get uh, they know about us. Vanity Ooh, check, Strider. The same thing you do with Lutris every morning when you wake up. You check your Google alerts, and you're like, "Oh, did anyone talk about Lutris?" Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> you you watch those uh, pingbacks <laughs> religiously. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing something a little bit different than, you know, we kind of violated the unspoken rule and definitely have broken it because, yeah. um, you know, if a project is doing something not very good, uh, it's kind of a responsibility to call them out on it. And yeah. the whole thing is like, no, you're supposed to, you're such a brave project. Thanks. And everything you do is flawless. And that's, that's just not true. It's 2016. We need to get that rid of that mentality. We need to praise the excellent, fantastic work. Yes. And call out some of the um, not so good stuff. I mean, I think that is just the way things are. But, hey, we have done another Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays. We want to thank everyone joining us live. Um, this will be out uh, later today. Uh, if you want to get back to us, you know how to do that. I'm Ben Vinstone. Hi. I'm Pedro Mateus. And I'm Matthew Commando. See you guys. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>